I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar on this topic, which is critical to farmers in the West, it's critical to our rural communities, and to Canada's contribution to global food security and production. I think it's worth uh, reminding people that Canada is only one of a handful of net food exporters that are large, and we see why this is so important every single day in the news. We have a great lineup of speakers uh, this afternoon, and uh, I'd like to note that all of them farm. In fact, two of them are taking a break from harvesting uh, to join us today, which I appreciate is neither a small nor easy sacrifice to make. Uh, with us today are the Honorable Nate Horner, Minister of Agriculture from the province of Alberta, uh, Sherilyn Jolly Nagel, who is um, a, a, a farmer and an advocate for agriculture, uh, we also have with us um, Alana Cook, who's the board chair for the Global Institute for Food Security, and Nevin uh, Rosassen, uh, who is a sustainability and government relations lead for the Alberta Pulse Growers. Um, let me give you a bit of background uh, before we bring our guests onto the panel screen. Um, I'll take two minutes to do that. Uh, in December of 2020, the federal government introduced a healthy environment, healthy economy plan which contain a 30% target to reduce emissions from nitrogen fertilizer between 2020 and 2030. It also opened a consultation process to gather feedback from stakeholders. Uh, earlier this year, the federal government published a discussion document and launched additional uh, consultations on that policy. And that, that process closes this week on, on Wednesday of this week. Uh, we know that farmers already care about GHG reductions they also care about food production, and the two are not mutually exclusive. A Canadian, and especially prairie farms, have already made significant reductions to their GHGs. Um, but there is, um, in my observation, a lot of anger in the prairies about the fertilizer reduction policy, but the issue is not from reducing emissions. Farmers have cut emissions and continue to implement practices to continue these reductions. But in my observation, uh, the anger stems from, uh, from three things. One is a distrust of the federal government based on the lack of recognition for what's already been implemented and the reductions that have already been made. Number two, the federal government seems to have failed to understand the hit that farmers took when the carbon tax was applied to grain drying. And number three, uh, that farmers have witnessed targets that have been set in other sectors, and most notably the oil sands, that have in fact become caps. And they're not certain, and they don't trust that this target uh, established won't follow that same path and become a cap. So we've already seen farmers who have been reducing their fertilizer emissions. We've seen an agreement between the federal government and the provincial governments on further reductions as part of the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Agreement. And now we have controversy. So what happened and where do we go through here from here? And so to help us uh, work through this, as I've uh, already introduced, uh, Nate Horner, Minister of Agriculture from Alberta, Sherilyn Jolly Nagel, Saskatchewan farmer and public advocate for farming, uh, Lana Cook, board chair for the Global Institute for Food Security, and Nevin Losasin, the Sustainability and Government Relations Lead for the Alberta Pulse Corps. So I'm going to um, have the screens turned on, and uh, I see that uh, our guests are coming on one by one. And I'm going to start with uh, Minister Nate Horner. Uh, Minister, you've got 60 seconds, uh, which given your significant background, uh, but I want you to provide us a background uh, and an introduction of yourself in the next one minute. Sure. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Nate Horner. I'm the MLA for Drumheller Stetler uh, in the in the southeast, central east portion of Alberta, and uh, honored to be the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, and Rural Economic Development. Uh, currently, I uh, I'm a farmer rancher uh, from from this area uh, south south of Hannah. Uh, it's kind of the the marginal area of the province, it's, it's low population, it's, it's big spreads of land, and uh, I've been doing that most of my adult life, uh, raise cattle and, and mix farm, 
or we're currently about halfway halfway done harvest and we've had a, a very decent year especially compared to last year um, and uh, generally across across the province um, in Alberta the crops look great and it, it's been quite a bounce back here considering uh, the dramatic difficulties of last year uh, but yeah honored to be here today um, I, I'm, I'm all in on agriculture always have been so it's it's great to um, have the opportunity to have this file and, and speak with you today. So thank, thank, thank you. Here. Thanks for joining us, Minister. Uh, I'm going to now turn to uh, Sherilyn Jolie Nagel. Sherilyn. Hi, you Gary. Introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I'm a farmer from South Central Saskatchewan. We are close to about three quarters finished harvest, and I am embarrassingly disheveled today because we are back. <laughs> in the field and uh, I, as you mentioned in the intro, we're in the middle of harvest, but this is an incredibly important topic for me and for a lot of the farm advocacy organizations that I'm a part of. Uh, I am a farmer, but you know, I, I really and truly, I think my hobby has become farm policy. I, I enjoy the rules around agriculture and trying to influence those rules. And I would say if there's something that's keeping me up at night besides you know, the, the stresses of, of harvest, it would be this fertilizer discussion. So I'm happy to say that my family is filling in for me right now in the field, and it's a pleasure to be here to talk about a, a really important issue. Sherilyn, thank you for joining us, uh, especially in, uh, in the middle of harvest. Alana, you're also a farmer, uh, but uh, give, us, uh, give us an introduction of yourself in the next one minute. Right. Thanks very much. Great to be here, Gary. So uh, I farm with my husband, Jerry Hertz, at Edenwald, Saskatchewan. We're about 30 miles northeast of Regina to give people a bit of a geographical connection there. And uh, we're grains, oil seeds, and pulse producers. We're about 10% into our harvest, so not nearly as advanced as Sherilyn. We're taking peas off. We've got a little bit of a rain break. We had an inch of rain yesterday. You always love those harvest rains. Not, not perfectly timed at all, but crops looking good. Um, we'll get, once we get the peas off this week, we'll have another week to 10 day break till our, um, our wheat canola and eventually flax is ready to go. Overall crops look average to kind of high average. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, along with being a farmer here in Saskatchewan, I'm the board chair of the Global Institute for Food Security, which is a really unique kind of public private research innovation organization um, in Saskatoon, um, along with the University of Saskatchewan and Nutrien and uh, the government of Saskatchewan. We, uh, we focus on development and delivery and distribution of innovative solutions for uh, sustainable crop production. Uh, I also am on a few other uh, volunteer organizations and just have been involved in the ag industry for almost 40 years. I can't believe I can say 40 years, but that's how long it's been. And I'm also a former Deputy Minister of Agriculture here in uh, Saskatchewan. I, I worked in the uh, Bradwell government as the Deputy Minister of Ag for just over nine years. Looking forward to today's discussion. This is a really important topic, so well worth coming into the house and getting out of the, the yard and the field to talk fertilizer. Looking forward to it, Gary. Thank you very much, Alana. I appreciate uh, your uh, participation in this. Uh, Nevin uh, Rosassen, uh, please uh, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll be uh, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you. Great, thank you very much, Gary, again for the opportunity to the Canada West Foundation to be here with the other esteemed panelists. And uh, like the other three, I am also a fourth generation food, fuel, fiber, and uh, feed production engineer or a farmer from East Central Saskatchewan. Uh, I still continue to farm with my family uh, on a grain, oil, seed, and pulse farm, and we've grown many different crops on our farm over the past, uh, I guess, 20, 25 years since I've been involved. So I do, uh, you know, as all the other panelists as well, uh, I love farming. It's a passion. I love the agricultural industry. I hold a Bachelor of Science of Agriculture uh, from the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, majoring in agronomy with a minor in ag economics. I was our on-farm business manager for roughly a decade before I went back to do a graduate degree in international trade policy. Uh, I attended the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, and uh, received a master's in international trade. So very interested in not only uh, uh, fertilizer emissions, uh, CO2, etc. I've been involved in carbon sequestration to 
different life cycle analyses, uh, looking at uh, the implications of uh, carbon footprinting on exports, uh, looking at things such as carbon border tariff adjustments uh, in graduate school back in 2008. And certainly I've had my fair share of uh, uh, policy uh, files. So I've worked at the provincial le level with the government of Alberta in the economics and competitive dis uh, division as a research economist. I've worked uh, on federal policies, different uh, areas, but certainly about 80% of my working time with Alberta Pulse Growers is focused on sustainability. And that includes not only emissions, uh, CO2, look, we're looking at regulated protocols, but also looking at pesticide use, uh, greatly involved with the Keep It Clean campaign, as well as other uh, really interesting initiatives such as Field Heroes and Entomology. So I get my fingers into all of different types of pots, but certainly emissions is something I've been looking at for uh, almost 20 years now. And happy to be Thanks. here. Thanks, Nevin. We appreciate you participating. I at Canada West Foundation, we are always focused on uh, bringing our members and our viewers uh, materials that are relevant and timely. And I think this is a relevant and timely subject. And we've, I think we've assembled a really, really uh, fantastic team of, uh, of panelists today. So uh, I'm going to start right off uh, to begin this discussion with a question to Minister Horner. Although anybody that's watching can uh, put something in the chat box. And I'll moderate the comments that come from the chat box and put them to uh, to our panelists uh, at appropriate times. But Minister, uh, let me start with you. Uh, you know, in July of this year, the federal and the provincial ministers signed the Sustainable uh, Canadian Agriculture Partnership Agreement to fund emission reduction activities. And yet, actually, just within days uh, of the ag ministers from all three provinces condemned uh, the 30% target with the Manitoba Agriculture Minister, uh, the Honorable Derek Johnson, saying that uh, estimates show meeting the target would require a 20% reduction in nutrient use. And for those that are uh, uh, lay people like me, I, I might use the word fertilizer, uh, and would result in lower crop yields. Uh, what happened? Can you explain what happened to the time of your meeting uh, with the federal government and this agreement? and uh, the, uh, the complaints that emerged very shortly thereafter. Sure, no, thank you, Gary. And uh, just for some, some background for everyone that's listening, uh, the, the next policy framework, uh, that's, that's what we were in Saskatoon to, to discuss and, and, and finalize this uh, five-year five -year deal between the individual provinces and the federal government. So these uh, negotiations and, and back and forth have been going on for, for multiple years. And this was, this was the culmination in, in Saskatoon. So it leads to a, a very regimented uh, agenda. It's, you, that's, that's what you're there to deal with is, is the next policy framework. So the, the fertilizer discussion uh, originally wasn't, wasn't on the, we, we asked to have it on and, uh, and we're able to, to get it in, uh, in, into the meetings. We thought it was important that with all the ministers sitting around the table that we have, have that discussion. Uh, but it wasn't linked to the next policy framework uh, specifically. But so how, how it worked, we, we did find a, a landing place on the next policy framework. We signed the deal, the Sustainable uh, Canadian Agriculture Partnership, and a, a five-year arrangement that, that holds um, all of the 60-40 uh, funding arrangements between the federal government and the provinces. The, the BRM suite uh, exists in there. All of our insurance programs exist in there. And as a, as a province, as we desperately wanted to see uh, more funding from the feds uh, be brought to the table. That, that wasn't originally part of the discussion. And so they, they did bring, bring the funding forward because we know they have uh, some, some real aspirations on, on the emission uh, uh, climate side. We wanted to make sure that the, the money uh, came, came with those pursuits, that we weren't diluting anything that existed. You know, we want a real robust insurance program for our producers. So that, that was kind of the conversation. Uh, it, it got brought on the agenda. And I guess the reason we, we put forward the press release, Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, following the, the, the next policy framework being signed, was just a, it, it left us with kind of a, a sour taste. We wanted to know, producers, producers are telling us, much like uh, we've talked about before, just this mistrust in the, in the, uh, 
in the process. They wanted to, to have a better understanding about what it, what it meant. They wanted some clarification. Uh, they, they wanted to know that they would, there would be recognition for the good work that already happened. They wanted to know that it wouldn't be um, voluntary or aspirational and then turn into something else. And so that was basically the discussion we had around there is we, we need more information across the country as to, as to where this is headed. And, and I appreciate some of the language has changed um, in the days and weeks since that meeting. Um, I think Minister Rabo has been more clear, um, more, more upfront about some of those, those terms like voluntary and aspirational, but uh, it, was, it was mostly just for, for us and our, our people, the people we represent, our industry groups, our producers, wanting some, wanting some more clarity on, on where we were going and whether or not the 30% target was, was up in the, it was on the table to be discussed, if that could change through the consulta consultation process. And when we didn't really get any, uh, any, any clarity after that, that's when the press release came up. So uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Alana for maybe a, a, a quick response to that. I mean, having been a deputy minister, uh, uh, with the provincial government and agriculture, maybe you, you can provide us with a bit of a quick response on whether federal provincial relationships have changed over time in a way that, it, like it seems to me that in past years, it's been much more collaborative, much more cooperative. Would you, is that a correct observation on my point? Well, you know, FPT discussions and conversations always have some tension to them because oftentimes there's, first of all, you know, with all the regions of the country, it's sometimes difficult to get all the provinces to agree. Uh, and oftentimes the federal government's trying to drive a particular direction, oftentimes a, a budget direction. Um, but what I would say is I think during my time as deputy um, and my time even in, uh, even in the 80s when I was on the political side of government and I was in the Minister of Agriculture's office, my observation would be that it was a far more collaborative conversation and consultative process with the provinces, almost as if we're all coming to the table with some mutual interests and mutual goals in mind, and then maybe some differences on, uh, you know, timing or um, making sure that there was a recognition of regionalities and challenges. So um, I think this is a, you know, a different, a different time with federal provincial relations. What I would say is, what I was really impressed in seeing evidence of this time is that the provinces all stuck together. Sometimes the federal government tries to divide and conquer. And I was very impressed mm -hmm. that the provinces were able to hold the line, work together, come together with, you know, really focused on seeing agriculture grow and being practical in solutions for agriculture and really holding the line even sometimes Quebec will have differences and this time everybody, every province, including Quebec, held the line and really, um, you know, took the federal government to task to make sure that first there was, you know, more funding, considering the expectations that the federal government has from uh, the agriculture sector and, uh, you know, mutual goals and interests really that the, that the province is focused on to really push the federal government where, um, where they needed to be uh, going. So, yeah, it's di certainly different than in many ways, the experience I had as deputy, but uh, good on the provinces for for um, getting what uh, what they got out of this discussion. Of course, much more to come as as there's uh, individual provincial negotiations to take place. But I think a really good start, considering how difficult uh, the relationship um, can be right now with the federal government with respect to agriculture policy. Thanks, Elena. Nevin, I'm going to go to you, and and the the minister really sort of foreshadowed this uh, when he was speaking it, that <clears throat> the, one of the complaints about the federal government's policy is that it doesn't recognize that farmers in the West have been doing their part uh, to reduce emissions through sustainable farming practices. But I think that you actually have some, some data uh, about Alberta's track record for overall farm emission sources and sinks. And so uh, can you outline that? And can you talk about you know, the national inventory reporting to the IPCC and their, uh, their current inability to accurately estimate on-farm fertilizer emissions. Uh, absolutely, Gary. Uh, farmers have made massive strides in reducing emissions across their farms, not to mention sequestering huge amounts of carbon in their soil. These practices include the elimination of summer follow, a common practice up until 
the 1980s, uh, the move to no-till, which I will leave the other farmers to discuss a bit further. But there are specific technologies and beneficial management practices farmers have already adopted, which have greatly reduced fertilizer emissions. And specifically, I think there are five key practices. Number one would be the 4R nutrient stewardship program. Number two, in terms of the uh, uh, impact, would be sectional control technology. Number three would be variable rate that's employed by quite a few farmers across the prairies. And number four, environmentally smart nitrogen and nitrification inhibitors. And of course, uh, number five would be sound agronomic crop rotations that include pulses. And uh, all of the farmers here have mentioned pulses already. Uh, they fix atmospheric nitrogen. So farmers have been adopting these emission reduction strategies because they make economic sense. A dollar saved is a dollar earned. And farmers have made these management changes on their farms in absence of government regulations. Not all farmers have made these shifts. And certainly adoption rates can be accelerated. So in regards to overall farm emission sources and sinks, Alberta, like Saskatchewan, has greatly increased soil sequestration since the 1980s through adoption of conservation cropping and no-till. The elimination of summer follow also reduced emissions. Emissions from crop residue and nitrogen fertilizer have increased over the period. However, the overall fertilizer use efficiency meaning the yield of grain per pound of fertilizer applied has greatly increased, meaning the same amount of fertilizer produces much more grain. The largest increase in overall crop emissions over time was actually from transportation. The prairies went from over 6,000 delivery points in the 1980s to less than 220 today. So the railways abandoned tertiary and secondary lines, resulting in all of those efficient rail uh, emissions being converted to farmer truck emissions. So the railways and grain companies effectively transferred their emissions to the backs of farmers. So farmers drive further than ever and are using semi-tractors uh, and therefore emitting. So this represents a real failure in public policy and an increase in the wear and tear on provincial highways, not to mention in safety. In regards to net carbon neutral position, uh, certainly, Alberta's crop sector emissions, including sources and sinks, achieved a net positive balance as of 2013. Same as Saskatchewan, meaning more CO2 was being sequestered on farms than emitted. And in 2016, Alberta, again, was net zero, just like Saskatchewan. This does not actually account for all the beneficial farm management practices related to fertilizer emission mitigating technologies and practices, meaning that these estimates are over uh, in fact, estimating fertilizer, or they're overestimating fertilizer emissions as they don't account for the on-farm BMPs or beneficial management practices. This means Saskatchewan Alberta farmers are indeed not carbon negative. They are not being credited, credited for it due to flawed national inventory reporting and the absence of regulated carbon offsets that could pay farmers for the carbon they are removing from the atmosphere. So you mentioned the National Inventory Reporting, or the NIR. It tracks how fertilizers are actually, it does not track, sorry, how fertilizers are actually being applied on farm. The NIR uses reported, reported fertilizer sales, multiplies the volumes by a coefficient for specific ecoregions, which then equates to total fertilizer emissions. Those coefficients do not account for fall applied anhydrous in dry conditions versus spring banded smart nitrogen. Certainly the sales will capture the reduced volume of fertilizer applied resulting from 4R, sectional control or variable rate. However, the, the emissions are currently overestimated and this is a real problem. The national inventory reports are then sent to the IPCC. So the federal government is reporting more nitrogen emissions to our international friends, which does a disservice to Canadian farmers. The federal government needs to overhaul the NIR to capture on-farm BMPs, recognize fertilizer emission reduction technologies, and build regulated carbon offset protocols that work to pay farmers for the CO2 they are capturing from the atmosphere, the CO2 they are no longer emitting, and recognize their sustainable practices. And in closing, farmers are tired of being painted as villains by our own government, when in fact, we are sequestering emissions from our urban cousins and international friends. Thank you. So there's a lot of data in what you just talked about, Nevin, and I know that you've actually got um, presentation slides that uh, maybe would, you know, actually encapsulate a lot of what you said. But uh, I guess the bottom line that I took from it is a lot of this stuff is already happening. 
because it makes economic sense, as you said. No farmer wants to pay a dollar more for fertilizer than they need. And so I'm going to flip over to Sherilyn and, and ask her, I mean, the kinds of practices, I mean, I, I don't know of any farmer that doesn't have an agronomist that works with them to talk about crop rotation, no-till and, you know, planting peas to, you know, restore the nitrogen back into the soil. But um, maybe you can tell us, Sherilyn, I mean, does, is this consistent with how uh, you're operating your farm? And, and uh, I mean, what are your concerns about the federal government's policy? Yeah, well, my concerns are high. I'm frustrated. And I'm frustrated, I suppose, most about the condescending approach that we've seen from government. So I could understand that, you know, people outside of the agriculture industry may not be fully aware of all of the new technology that farmers have adapted, because there's a lot of it. And it's hard for even us in the industry to keep on top of all of this, you know, technological advancement that's coming our way. So I can appreciate when anyone outside the industry doesn't know all of it. What I don't appreciate is it feels to me like the government has come out of their bedroom in the morning, having had a dream that says we want to be better environmentalists and let us help the farmers do that. And here's our, our ideas and our solutions without fully comprehending and understanding and consulting with, with farmers about what we're doing today. So Nevin did a great job of listing a lot of the advancements that farmers have, have adopted over the last couple of years. And those are very reflective of the farm practices right here on my farm, both on the Jolly side and the Nago side. For, for generations of farmers that have been in my family, we have done our best to make good decisions. And I don't want to leave the impression that Every morning, you know, my husband and I wake up and, and we have a cup of coffee and ask each other what we're going to do to reduce emissions today. But it is part of the bigger picture. It's part of our, our long-term sustainability. My family has been farming this land for more than 100 years. To me, it was obvious that we've been making good decisions all along. And then we have a government, you know, who's wagging their finger at us on a constant basis saying, you have to do better which I appreciate, but their, their information and their baseline of what we're doing today is completely off. They're, they're not fully understanding the crop rotations that we have, the GPS, the, the sectional control and the variable rate, all of those highly, highly advanced uh, production practices that we have on the farm. So that's my regret is that they didn't come to us and say, hey, we're, we're worried about emissions. Can you tell us how you're addressing that? Can you explain to us the situation today so that we can better understand what's happening? And I want, I want those consumers that are watching this webinar today to just understand the basics. Nevin is a wealth of knowledge and, and there's a lot of organizations that have all of the data. But for me as a farmer, it's very basic. It's basic math. When I'm thinking about how much fertilizer to use every year, we, we account for the goal, which is our yield production. So what do we want to produce off the farm this year? Here's our goal. The recipe for that is pretty simple. We need good seed. You know, we need to start with a good seed that's gonna germinate. We need to have the nutrient package to help that grow. That's our fertilizer. And we need rain. Rain is a limiting factor here in Southern Saskatchewan. So my combination is to best guess the rain that we're going to get with the nutrients for that seed to give us the yield projection. It's pretty simple math. In fact, um, 20 years ago, we used to play on the computer with this little, it was like called Brain Buster. It was before there was things like apps and it was an actual picture of a bin that would have an auger inside that would load the grain. And you could get the grain to move to fill the bin depending on how much rain you could get and how much nutrients. So it would literally build the bin for you to bust it open to meet your yield production if you could get the rain and if you had the nutrients. For us on our farm, we put the for our fertilizer in with the seed in the spring. So 
in the middle of the growing season, if it happens to rain more, we know that we've got the potential to grow the crop, to, to get that yield goal. If it doesn't rain, that fertilizer is there for us again for the next year. And so I know that the government wants us to prove it. We're, we're fighting with them saying, we are doing a good job. Damn it, I don't know why you can't see that. And they're asking us to prove it. And we wanna be able to do that. So one of the ways we can do that is through soil testing. We can show them, and, and this isn't new, we've always been doing soil testing. It, it was, you know, I don't know if Nevin mentioned soil testing, but it's a really important part of our farm practice is to find out what nutrients are available in the soil for us to use and what do we need to add to it. So crop rotation helps us leave nutrients in the soil and fertilizer helps us give nutrients in the soil. So we will take on one field, we could take as many as 160 soil samples from one field. And that will break that field down into eight or nine different zones. And each zone has its own fertilizer prescription. It, it's sim I see a little colorful map behind you, Gary, and I don't know what's on it, but that kind of looks like a map that we might get for a field that needs a fertilizer prescription. Every zone within our field needs a different fertilizer prescription. So we are very, very careful when it comes to how much fertilizer to put down. Nevin talked about the four R's. That means that we are using the right fertilizer at the right rate, at the right place, and at the right time. So why I'm frustrated is for generations on our farm, Farmers have been doing good things. We've been making good decisions that allow the next generation to farm. But the government keeps, you know, putting their hands on their fists and, or their fists on their elbows saying, listen, you know, you're not doing a very good job. You have to do better. And we get frustrated because they really don't know what we're doing in the first place. So it, it to me, it's a, it's a chance for us to have a much more in-depth conversation about all the good things that agriculture is doing today so that we can show, we can really prove how good we are. My hope at the end of this is that we have a government who can give us a thumbs up to say, we're really worried about the environment, but one thing we don't have to worry about is the way our producers produce food, fuel, and fiber. Those people know what they're doing. Thanks, Sherilyn. Uh, I was passionate. I'd have to say if I was surveying, I would never have to mark you down as undecided. So I, I really appreciate that passion. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over to Alana now, who uh, told me before our call, I mean, she's been farming for, with her husband for over 40 years. And, and so I'm going to ask you, uh, I mean, are your farming practices similar to what uh, Sherilyn's describing? And I'd also like to put on your hat as uh, chair of the Global Institute for Food Security and uh, ask you what your concerns are about, you know, food production in the light of a fertilizer emissions reduction target. I know you got lots to say about that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gary. I should qualify that and say I've been in the ag industry for 40 years. Yes, I was raised as a farm kid. Haven't been quite farming with my husband for 40 years, but we've been we've been farming for uh, for a while already, but I've uh, been around the industry for, for, for almost 40 years. You know, as, as a farmer, um, of course, you know, picking up on both what Nevin talked about as far as, you know, the five key practices for, you know, sustainable crop production. And then Cheryl Lynn spoke to, you know, variable rates and the four R's and uh, sectional control um you know we're we're minimum tillage farmers here uh we definitely are are practicing for our fertilizer application we run a sustainable crop rotation you know a three-year four crop rotation which um, you know has improved our soil health um Sherilyn talked about generations of farmers i mean the reality is as we're seeing improved soil health uh, better crop productivity you know more i like to describe it as more crop per drop you know we we are producing more food on the same amount of land and that's because of our better sustainable practices focused on um productivity that doesn't overuse inputs i don't know why uh sometimes there's this misunderstanding that farmers want to over apply over apply fertilizer over apply pesticides over apply you know whatever when when that is about our competitiveness and our profitability so we're only using the amount that we absolutely need to use as sherilyn said very 
um, you know, a very prescriptive uh, approach to how we're producing food on our farms. And that certainly is the practice that those are the practices that Jerry and I use here on our farm. Um, you know, when I think about this from uh, the perspective of a farmer, but also the board chair of the Global Institute for Food Security, I think, you know, there's there's a couple things I might say is, you know, first of all, when the federal government thinks about targets and how we're going to achieve these um, these goals, uh, as Sherilyn said, you know, ho hopefully they'll they'll have a look at their measures, make sure their measures are, are right. Nevin and, and Sherilyn both spoke spoke about that that they're not measuring the right thing. They're also using a baseline of 2020 right now in the discussion paper, which is completely unfair because it's capturing all the benefits that we've made on the farm up until 2020 and saying, well, that's in the bank. Now you need to do better. Well, we've definitely focused on continuous improvement, but we need to be fair about benchmarks and measures and accurate and science based. And I'm not sure that that that's exactly where they're starting from, though I'm pleased to see they're open to um, more conversation and, you know, they seem to be more consultative now since they sort of um, came out of the gate. I think the key here is that um, we need to be measure, measuring as a productivity function. It's about intensity rather than an absolute measure. It's about, you know, how do we achieve uh, less um, impact is by, you know, ensuring that we're having sustainable practices that that all of us have spoken to, um, you know, definitely not looking to reduce food production and definitely not looking for unintended consequences, which actually might make us less environmentally sound with our practices because of this sort of confused policy approach with uh, this goal of reduced emissions. And so food must be produced and why would we not incentivize it in the world's most sustainable agricultural country, which is Canada? The reality is, is Canadian farmers have been and remain at the forefront of innovation in global agriculture because of innovation, because of our willingness to quickly adapt and adopt. Um, Canadian farmers have been making meaningful emission reductions on farm for decades while growing more food consistently on the same land base. And this, this has to be fundamental. So there can't be a reduction in emissions at all costs because we're being asked to feed the world. Now more than ever, there's this challenge of ensuring that we have improved global food security, not not further risks to global food security. If I think about the work we're doing at, at GIFS, at the Global Institute, um, you know, we're working on things that are, are focused on innovation and improvement. And that's what it's about is continuous improvement. We're working on improving plant sufficient uptake and utilization of nutrients. So, um, you know, that's important. We're working on a project about boosting photosynthesis in crops, which again, increases the efficiency of nu nutrients and, you know, our fertilizer. So, so it's through these kinds of research and innovation and investment and incentivization of doing more with less, recognizing that we've had continuous improvement, you know, absolutely focused on continuous improvement, but don't take our tools away on us. I, you know, what I worry about at GIFTS is I know we can feed the world. Will we be allowed to? You know, will the federal government take away our tools and technologies that won't allow us to feed the world? That's the biggest risk. I have no question at all that we can innovate organizations like GIFTS and so many of the crop commissions across the West and, and so many of the private sector are investing in innovation so that we can feed the world. Let's make sure we have the regulatory environment that allows us to feed the world, that in fact incentivizes and gives us pathways to improve and to see this continuous improvement rather than it stopping it. So what I always say is, you know, policy and regulation should be about boundaries, not barriers. And that's what I worry about with this potential impact of right now, what looks to be a conversation and a discussion. And I hope it remains that way and we end up in the right place rather than some sort of, um, you know, maybe well-meaning, but I think very, um, you know, sort of misinformed perhaps, misunderstood, and perhaps a policy that could end up having unintended consequences of in fact reducing our environmental sustainability, definitely reducing our economic sustainability, and for sure having an impact on social sustainability efforts, for example, in feeding the world, because I know Canada can. Canadian farmers absolutely have been doing that, and we can continue to do that in the best way possible around the world. 
if we don't feed the world with our sustainable practices, other countries will step in and they're far less sustainable than us. And that just seems like a disservice to the world and to the Canadian economy and Canadian farmers and Canadian people. Well, that's a passionate answer. I see that uh, Sherilyn has given you a, a, a two thumbs up, uh, an Ebert and Cisco uh, approval of your message. Um, I, I, I'd also I'd maybe make the same observation that if we took out the word agriculture and put in oil and gas, you might be giving the same kind of answer uh, as, and response as you just did, Alana. But, but I saw Minister Horner really, uh, uh, really nodding in agreement with a lot of the stuff that you're saying. And you know, as a as a former as a former elected person, I, I have to defer to an, a current elected person to maybe make comment on what you had to say, Alana. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gary. No, uh, I was nodding vigorously with the, with a lot of what Alana and Sherilyn uh, and Nevin said, and that was that was kind of how we've tried to frame this conversation when we've had the opportunity uh, with the federal minister uh, and her colleagues is talking about the the whole big picture. I have I've yet to meet a producer that's uh, that that isn't isn't proud of what they're doing and doesn't say um, you know we know we can do more. Through, through research, uh, through, through adoption of, of best management practices, we have to know that we're being recognized for what we've already done. I know I, I tell the story during the Calgary Stampede, I, I, I had the opportunity to meet with dozens of companies and countries that they wanna come here to see what Western Canada has to offer, whether it's, whether it's equipment, whether it's technology, whether it's, it's genetics uh, in, in, crops, in crops or livestock. The whole world's looking at us as 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 a solution to global global food security, and for us to limit ourselves in 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 any way without just having a full conversation, uh, really really seems like it's uh, going down a dangerous path. So we want to frame it as uh, under the intensity uh, perspective, like Alana said. Let's talk about let's talk about the most sustainable bushel. Let's talk about the work that's that's already been done. Zero till started in the '80s, you know, and especially the way technology cascades through from from large farms to small. It takes multiple years. There's not enough money in, in the world to to really uh, change and incentivize uh, the, that timeline and make it super quick. Um, but we know we want to we know we want to use carrots and not sticks. How can we make it move a little faster? How can we get a little quicker quicker adoption and work with our producers and not not in a scary way? Because like Alana said, so much of, of being sustainable is also about being economically sustainable. You know, margins are tight. Everyone's seen input costs uh, for everything go through the roof, uh, not not just fertilizers. So. We want to keep our, our producers and, and those rural communities uh, vibrant, still the, the fabric that, that holds a lot of Western, Western Canada together. And so that's, when I, when I think about this whole, the fog of this consultation, I, I would call it, people just, just want clarity and want to know that that's being understood. And as a provincial politician asking that of my federal ag minister, I want to know that, that, uh, that they understand it. And, and I want to know where, where they're truly going with this. Is this a number that's been, been uh, thrust upon their department? Do they, and and how, can we, how can we show them that we want to continue to feed the world and be sustainable, be economically viable, and grow? Um, we, I'm, I'm totally confident that we can prove that we are uh, the lowest uh, emission bushel of, of canola or, or wheat uh, in, in the world and still give our producers uh, room to grow um, because mar margins are tight. So there was a, a few things that FP, I just wanted to share a couple uh, things that stuck with me. There was a Saskatchewan producer there, third generation farmer, and he, and he told the federal ministry, he said, you know why we're, we're, we're scared? You know why we want more clarity? Because the only thing that can make me go broke is government policy. With our, with our crop rotations, uh, with, with the research that's been done, with we, we have this down to a science with the risk mitigation tools that, that are out there. The only thing is government policy to make, make me go broke. And the, the other thing uh, that stuck with me when we're talking about feeding the world and needing to grow, um, in the next 40 years, the world will need to produce and create as much food as it has in the last 10,000 years. And I think that, that really paints a picture for, for the work that still needs to be done. And so 
as, as an elected person, I just, I'm trying to, you know, convey that message to our, to our federal counterparts and, uh, and do it in a collaborative way. And, and much of, much of FPT was collaborative. It's just, um, this fertilizer discussion is, is, uh, we, we're still seeking more, more clarity, wanting to know where it's going. So, uh, thanks minister. Uh, let me say, I mean, we've got about 12 minutes left to the hour, the top of the hour. I, I know that we've struck the right chord of getting the right panelists and the right subject and being committed to Canada West Foundation's mission of being timely and being relevant and bringing our supporters the best panelists and the best information we can. And it's evident from, I've been watching the, uh, uh, the chat box and there is a lot of commentary in the chat box and I won't be able to get to every question in it, but let me try and let me try and summarize a few things uh, on a couple of subjects. Well, one question from Dylan that was, uh, I think, quite good was, and, and, and there were a number of others that followed on the NIR. His question, and I'll read it verbatim, is there's only six or seven harvests left before 2030. How soon would the NIR and measurement methodologies need to change in order for farmers to know how much is needed to be reduced and what needs to get done to get to the 2030 targets and are the measurement methodology changes coming? Maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Nevin. Yeah, absolutely. And I did respond to a similar question in the chat. I do believe the good people at AAFC understand that they're not currently capturing the BMPs that are being employed on farm. The issue becomes how to actually capture that data. So whether it's increased uh, number of surveys, uh, Stats Canada surveys to capture practice changes to look at what are the rates of adoption. I mean, certainly Sherry Lynn, Nate and Alana are all bleeding edge uh, farmers. So certainly a lot of these technologies have already been adopted on their farms. Uh, but that doesn't mean everyone is doing this. So the question becomes how quickly can we gather the data to accurately reflect where emissions are at on farm from fertilizer. So that's probably the crux. I believe that uh, farmers will be continuing to adopt. I mean, the biggest impetus for our farm to purchase a sectional control this drill this year was thirteen or fourteen hundred dollar uh, urea, right? So we couldn't afford to over apply. So you know, in, in fields that uh, we have that are very chopped up, we don't have the beautiful open uh, hills like south of Regina. Uh, or fields rather, ours are chopped up. So we have about 95 to 105 acres per field. So to give you an example, this year on our worst field, last year seeding it with a 47 foot drill, we seeded out 144 acres. This year with a sectional control 60 foot drill, we managed to seed only 122 acres. So we avoided overlapping 20 acres of fertilizer and seed, huge reduction. So. Uh, farmers are going to continue to adopt technologies because, like I said earlier, they can't afford not to. The question is whether or not the data and surveys that the AAFC and Stats Canada put out can actually uh, accurately um, find out how many farmers, how many acres are adopting these technologies. So I, th I think AAFC will move to uh, try to capture this to actually update their estimates. But I mean, we're gonna have other technologies, they already exist so we can actually monitor on farm. Uh, Sherry Lynn mentions soil testing. I mean, we can do benchmark testing and show that our organic matter is improving vastly over time. And certainly I, I believe that farmers will meet the challenge without government regulation. And certainly we would much rather have carrots than sticks. So there are certain ways that we could accelerate the adoption uh, using tax instruments, whether it's, um, you know, tax credits or looking at accelerating depreciation that you can write off, things like that for farmers who have already purchased or adopted these technologies. Uh, but certainly, you know, having more farmers soil sample, I mean, there are some that don't do it. And so, frankly, they're leaving a lot of uh, low hanging fruit because certainly they could be increasing their fertilizer and getting drastically improved yields or decreasing on fields or in certain areas of your field as Sherry Lynn uh, mentioned. So certainly I think we can uh, rise to the challenge. I think we'll easily be able to produce enough food. Uh, farmers will grow more food if it's worth dollars. Uh, the issue becomes the ability to afford food. So that, that's where we have a huge inequality. I think Sherry Lynn wanted to comment on this. Yeah, Gary, if I could, if I could add to some of what Nevin was saying. 
I, I want to overemphasize the complexities of these decisions. And this is a massive conversation that we should have, but I'm a firm believer that these are decisions that are best left in the hands of the farmers. It can seem simple, you know, find ways to reduce emissions, but it's very complex. And let me just give you one small example. We've talked to, uh, several times today about the farm practice of crop rotations. That means very basically that farmers will, won't, we're not planting the same crop on the same piece of land over and over. We're rotating pulse crops with oilseed crops with cereal crops, and that's beneficial for the soil. However, on our farm, if we were to, to, to purchase or rent a new piece of land, that, that was in a pulse crop and the rest of the land nearby was in a cereal crop. It might initially make sense to keep that one piece of land in its own rotation, but the long-term ramifications of that have to be considered. For our farm, it would make sense for that small new piece of land to get incorporated into the bigger piece of land for all kinds of efficiencies. So we are making decisions, so many decisions every single day, and it would be impossible for a government policy regu or regulatory body to take into consideration every one of those decisions. So the point I want to make today is that the goal cannot be to reduce emissions at all costs. There are, are too many other, there are too many other pieces of that puzzle that every farmer is trying to consider. And what I really want is for the government to acknowledge that the only way the land that can be transferred through our farm family for that many generations is to acknowledge that we are making the best decisions we can today. And if there's a new technology out there that our farm hasn't yet adopted, it's because we haven't found a way to, to meet the return on the investment. We'll get there eventually, we hope, if the, if the if the new technology warrants it, we'll get there. But you have to leave these decisions in the, in the hands of the people who know best, and that is the farmers. And the, the thing that we are missing from the government today is an acknowledgement that farmers are doing a very good job already of growing food and fuel and fiber very sustainably. We're making good decisions today for the long term. We're at five minutes to the hour, and, uh, and again, I'm going to try and encapsulate some of the questions that I've seen in the chat box, and I'm going to uh, have all of you, whoever wants to make a comment on this. I mean, Sherilyn, you, you talked about what the objective is. So how do we get there? I mean, what is it that we need to do? Minister, what do we need to do as elected people to uh, get the federal government around to this understanding? I mean, what does the Global Institute for Food Security do? What the you know industry associations, be it pulse growers, individual farmers, who has this role for trying to get the federal government to come to this understanding that Sherilyn's just described? I, I think I think we all do, Gary, and I, and I honestly I think we're doing it, and I think we're doing it right now. Um, you know, and and part part of the reason uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta uh, and Ontario um, pushed out that press release is because. We, we felt like we needed to kick the dust up on this a little bit. We needed this conversation to get, get a little heightened. Um, everyone's watched what's happened in Sri Lanka and the Netherlands. You know, we, this, this conversation around, around policy is it's happening globally. And we want to make sure that our, our federal government um, understands that uh, they need to talk to us. Not, not, not me as a provincial ag minister specifically, but the, the country, our producers, and we need to talk to those who aren't producing too, uh, because this is about food security. It's about food affordability. We, we need all Canadians to become invested in this conversation and, and learn more, learn, learn about the good work that is happening uh, across, across the country. And uh, it's a conversation I think most are, are eager to have. People wanna talk about where their food comes from, how it's produced, is it being produced locally? And so I, I think I think we're doing it, Gary, and we just need to continue. I, I know this consultation goes uh, till the end of the month, and we're all very eager to to see what what comes out of it. Uh, but the ad advocacy will continue from the provinces, and I know it will from our our different industry groups, and, it, and it'll need to. 
Well, let me ask this then to the panel. I mean, are you optimistic that changes will be made or are you pessimistic? Well, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was at the start, Gary, simply because it seems like they're maybe listening a little more. Uh, they're focused less on, you know, kind of shoving this along. They look to be looking to have a conversation and a discussion. And I hope, um, you know, I, I hope that is um, exactly where they're ending up. You know, the Deputy Prime Minister actually tweeted uh, some commentary about how, how good practices are for farmers and that she's confident in what farmers are trying to achieve with continuous improvement and sustainable practices. That's encouraging. I hope that now that begins to influence federal decision making. And, uh, you know, it needs to be a whole systems approach from the federal government on tackling emissions reduction, but it's in concert with and in cooperation with farmers, the full industry, with innovation organizations, with provincial governments who have practical solutions. Because we agriculture is the solution. We are not the problem. And I think the Canadian government, in fact, needs to champion Canadian agriculture around the world versus indicating why agriculture is the problem. And um, so I am optimistic, but it's very cautious optimism. And it, it means we all have to have our foot fully on the gas to get the message across and uh, we need to make the most of this opportunity to get the message across to our federal government. Nevin, optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, very optimistic. I mean you can't be a farmer and not be optimistic or you wouldn't be seeding <laughs> yeah. this crop. Uh, I believe that uh, you know whether it's a 30 percent emission reduction target uh, you know, farmers will easily be able to meet even a 30% reduction from 2020 levels. We're already halfway there, if not further. We just need to start, like other panelists have said, recognizing the advancements that farmers have made. I mean, we, there's ways we can accelerate adoption rates with uh, some of those tools uh, using carrots instead of sticks. But uh, certainly, you know, farmers, we're always innovative. We're the most rapid adopters of technology across any industries. And I have no uh, no hesitation that we can continue to make advancements in technology. The issue becomes, as Sherilyn said, there's so many trade-offs, so many things to consider. Farmers are always balancing agronomy, logistics, and economics. And, you know, some of them might not be able to put all their fertilizer down in the spring. They may have to put it down in the fall. But certainly we can continue to accelerate adoption rates of all of these fertilizer emission reduction technologies. And again, Canadian farmers are the most sustainable uh, farmers in the world. It's been shown time and time again. So it's time for us to be recognized for those emission reductions that have already been made. Thanks, Nevin. Uh, look, we're, we're at one of the hour and uh, we'll, uh, we'll close at two o'clock. Let me just say and summarize this, that uh, based on the comments in the chat box, and again, we had over 300 registrants for today's event, uh, comments on the panel were fantastic. And there was a lot of information that you conveyed and there would be no way for us to be able to get through all the questions that were in the chat box. But I think that we're on the right track. I, I like the sense of optimism uh, that we can go forward and, and, uh, and make changes. Uh, you know, responsibility rests with, uh, with all of you and the people that are listening. Uh, maybe every farmer out there needs to adopt a member of parliament who's never actually stepped foot on a farm uh, to get them to understand what it is that you do and how you do it, uh, to describe what precision farming is. And, you know, all of the practices that, uh, you know, uh, members of parliament who come from, you know, Toronto, or even Calgary, have never stepped foot on a farm. And maybe, maybe they need to know and see what's going on. Because I've always believed that, you know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a visit is worth a thousand pictures. And I know that if we went to any of your farms, uh, we'd, uh, we'd be all impressed uh, with the practices that we've seen. So with that, I'll draw us to a close. I thank all of the people who uh, participated on our panel, a fantastic panel. I thank all of the people who watched, which I, I saw notes from people from British Columbia to Ontario and all places in between, from Ottawa, from uh, Regina, Saskatoon, uh, Ed, uh, Regina, I just comment because I've got this in my hand. And, and uh, I, I just say, uh, as a final message, Canada West Foundation is a uh, not not for profit um, charitable organization. Uh, we rely on donors uh, to keep our uh, keep doing the work that we do. If you like what you've seen, uh, go to our website. Uh, be prepared to make a big donation, a large check. If it's too big, I'll send back the difference. Uh, that's the deal. So 
Uh, with that, uh, again, I close by thanking our panelists, uh, Minister Horner, Nevin, Sherilyn, and Alana, and uh, maybe we'll be getting back together on this subject uh, if and when there's changes to the federal government's policy or if there isn't. And uh, thank you for your participation. We'll draw this now to a close. I bid you all well.